I'm very excited to be here and glad to welcome all of you to the virtual San Francisco Dharma Collective. And, and by the way, we're from like one, two, three, four, five states and Canada. And there's more people from outside of California than inside California. So that's, that's one of the things that this epidemic has brought us. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. How wonderful, right? Wow. Yes. Well, it's wonderful to um, get to know you all a little bit and find out where you're from and what brought you here. So thank you so much for being here. And again, if you haven't seen the link, um, maybe no, maybe pop it in one more time, um, uh, just to make sure that you have that you're looking at the tanka that we're going to be talking about. And this particular image is actually a photograph of a tanka that hangs in a friend of mine's um, uh, chiropractic practice office. And she bought the Tonka in Nepal in probably 1970. And it is, we don't know, of course, who the, who the artist is, but it's truly one of the most beautiful Tonkas, maybe the most beautiful Tonka I've ever seen. I'm sitting in a room uh, that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think I, if I'm counting correctly, eight or nine tankas. And, um, you know, I'm a, an aficionado of tankas and we had a, we have nine, we have nine. <laughs> we have, um, we had the good fortune to receive many tankas as presents from a group of Tibetan Buddhist monks from the Gaden Shartse Monastery, whom we hosted here in the United States for a year long cultural tour, which they, they got in a van and they went all across the United States and we set up uh, places for them to give talks and empowerments and um, they earned enough money to rebuild their monastery, which was kind of a big deal. So, um, so that's why I have so many tankas here, but this tanka um, is, um, you know, we, you know, again, we don't know who the artist, you never, you rarely know who the artist is of a tanka. And I, you know, I always pay homage to that artist because I feel that this person must have really understood things at a very deep level. And I'm very grateful to that person who created this image that has become, it sounds like for many of you, a central image in your life. And it's certainly a central image in my life. And as, um, as was mentioned, it hangs at the main altar at the Sacred Stream Center. And um, a friend of mine, so, so my friend who is the chiropractor went on vacation and I had the bold boldness to say, can I take your Tonka home <laughs> for your vacation? And she was very kind and she lent it to me. And then I have another friend um, who is a professional photographer and she came and she took, and her name is Deborah. And I just want to thank Deborah for having made this incredibly beautiful image, um, you know, with this very fine camera. And um, as, as you may have heard, you can actually, if you want a hard copy of this, we do make it available at the sacredstream.org um, a website in the store there you can you can buy it you can buy a small one or a big one and or a medium-sized one and um, you can have it hard copy too if you like so this is the the genesis of this particular uh, tanka and um, of course of Avalokiteshvara or Chenrezig has there's many 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 forms of tankas um, that are made to honor the deities and this is what tankas are in general they are they are images that capture the field of energy that each of the deities represent. And you find tankas much more frequently in the Himalayas than you do in other parts of the East or, or West where Buddhism is, is um, practiced. And my personal theory about that um, is that when Buddhism came to the Himalayas and into Tibet, 
you know, between 800 and 1100. Um, there was a very widespread and widespread practice of a shamanic practice called burn. And in shamanic practice, you have many types of um, helping spirits that are part of the practice and that are encountered through working in an altered state practice. Often you know, it can be through psychotropic plants or it can be through something called the shamanic journey which or other methods of altering the state of consciousness. And so within shamanic practice, whenever you're working shamanically, you know, a, a, a practitioner will have a relationship with many, uh, often with many um, helping spirits in the form of nature. And so when Buddhism came to the Himalaya, it brought with it all of, you know, all of these different uh, images or, um, or concepts probably. And um, they were, it was a natural marriage to bring these different forms of power these different fields of power that are condensed into these images and to have so many proliferate and so many types of relationships and different types of powers that these different fields of intelligence offer. And of course, in Buddhism, they take the forms of different Buddhas and you can have, of course, like I'm looking at White Tara, who is often, this is a field of energy that is related to purity and to longevity and to removing the obstacles to longevity. I'm also looking at uh, uh, Vajra, Vajra oh, that's, no, that's, that's Vajrapani, who we're also going to be looking at in this Tanka, who is one of the Dharma protectors. I'm looking at Green Tara, who is known as a savioress. Vajrapani is the is the embodiment of Buddhist of Buddha's power, and Green Tara is known as a savioress. She's someone that people call upon when they're having difficulty. And sitting behind me, I don't know if you can see, you can't see it, but the the monks left a picture of the Dalai Lama on the Medicine Buddha Tanka behind me. And of course, the med medicine Buddha is uh, a field of healing power. And uh, Tsongkhapa is here as well. And we talked about Tsongkhapa. He's the, he was the founder of the God and Shartse Monastery. And he's, of course, the main lineage holder there. And then I also have uh, um, Jambala, uh, the, the Buddha of Abundance. So there are all these, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of all of the different deities that are portrayed in Tonkas. And they are teaching tools and they are designed to bring into ordinary reality to help, to help people access the fields of power that are encountered in non-ordinary reality by again altering the state of consciousness through meditation or through the shamanic journey or some other method of altering the state of awareness and um and it it's a wonderful they're wonderful tools because they allow people to step into this numinous world that is encountered in meditation and it gives people another doorway, perhaps people who don't have a well-developed um, internal practice can develop their internal practice by stepping into these doorways that these images provide. And, um, and we're going to be looking at this particular Tonka, finally. <laughs> and um, the central image, of course, let's describe the Tonka, the, the, the different images. One of the reasons I love this Tonka so much is because it is so rich in iconography and it, and it is so filled with power. And um, I'm going to be talking about the different aspects of um, the different emanations of power that are in this Tonka. 
So we have, of course, in the central figure is Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara. And of course, Chenrezig is the Buddha of infinite compassion. And we're going to be talking extensively about that. And then above him, we have the five Buddha families. Um, you'll see uh, five uh, couples um, uh, and, uh, and, they're and you'll see the male and the female together. Um, and the five Buddha families are fields of transmutation. And I'll, we'll talk about all the things that they transmute. But they're transformational fields, a very active transformational fields. And uh, coming down the sides of the uh, tanka, um, then you encounter two dakinis on either side of Chenrezig. It's two women um, in this kind of beautiful mountainous region pouring uh, liquids and doing things that dakinis do. And we'll talk about what dakinis are. They, they are very important figures in, in, um, in Tibetan Buddhism. They are the embodiment of enlightened wisdom energy, different types of wisdom energy. And then coming down, you have um, on the left side, we have Manjushri, who we met last week, who is the Buddha of wisdom and uh, learning and mental clarity. And then on the right, we have the, the Dharma protector that we mentioned, Vajrapani, who is uh, the embodiment of, Buddhists, of, Buddha, of infinite Buddha power, of power, Buddha's infinite power. And in the middle, we have an interesting conglomeration of, of images, a uh, mirror and the neck of the lyre and um, several other images in the middle, which we'll talk about. So, you know, we, that's, the, that's kind of the tour of this, this particular tanka. And, you know, those of you that know tankas, it sounds like there's a lot of you that do, you know that it's not that common to have a tanka that has so many aspects to it. And there's a reason for this, and we'll talk about the reason at the end. Um, and, um, but let's, let's wade in and look at the central, the central, um, the central figure, which is Chenrezig. And, uh, we'll be doing a meditation, uh, later on, on this figure. So take a, take, take a good look and, um, a good feel, <laughs> you know, like, like feel like look with your eyes, but also with your heart. So Chenrezig is an emanation of infinite compassion. And um, if you were to look closely at that halo of white around him, you will see that that is actually a thousand arms. This is the thousand arm uh, image of Chenrezig. There are, um, there's a four armed image as well. And these thousand arms indicate that he can see. And if you look closely in the middle of each of his palms, you will see that there's an eye. And so what this indicates is that Chenrezig and his infinite, and I'm using the word he or his, but this is really all of these beings are beyond gender. They, you know, I'm, I should probably say they, but it, it's, you know, you know um, I may use he or I may use she, but, or I may use they, but it's beyond gender. So in this, it indicates that in a thousand different moments in a thousand different ways or in what sorry excuse me in one moment in a thousand different places the buddha is perceiving the suffering and extending compassionate presence to the suffering of beings and if you look at the in, internal uh set of arms they are carrying different types of implements so you have things like the noose that binds the initiate to their vows. 
you have the mind of the Buddha, which is refreshing and purifying. You have uh, the flaming sword, which uh, cuts through delusion. You have the opala, the, the, um, the, the herb, the flower that cures all ills. You have um, a variety of implements that Chenrezig uses to relieve the suffering that he is perceiving and extending in his assistance to in a thousand places at once. Okay. So there's this indication of this capacity to perceive suffering and to offer relief from it in, 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 a, in a many, many different places at once, in many, many different beings who are suffering. And then you have 11 heads on top of his head. And that indicates that this activity that he's engaged in of perceiving suffering offering compassion, offering the tools that are necessary to a hundred to a thousand places at once is happening in 11 realms at once. So you begin to really get an understanding of the, the extent of this compassionate power. And at the top, you have the head of the Buddha, which is a reminder that Avalokiteshvara is an emanation of the Buddha. And very important to remember. And let's look at his um, rainbow skirts. So you see the rainbow skirts are yellow, blue, all the colors of the rainbow. And this is a very important, the rainbows play a very important role in uh, energy medicine and in Tantra. And this is a reference to the elements, um, yellow is earth, green is air, blue is water, red is fire, white is void. And the, this is an indication that Chenrezig has mastery over the elements. And within Tantra, you also have this concept of the five pure lights, which are the subtle expressions of, of the elements. And this indicates also his mastery of the five pure lights and also the movement of phenomenon from the grosser expression on the elemental level on the physical material plane to the more subtle levels of the five pure lights um, which are more associated uh, with the enjoyment body. And the elements, of course, are more associated with the form body. But this indicates his capacity to move across these levels of manifestation and to have mastery over them, which is a pretty major thing, <laughs> right? And then you have in his hands uh, that are here at his chest, you see the glimmering of the wish-fulfilling jewel. This is a marvelous thing, the wish-fulfilling jewel, and it's just what it says. It can fulfill all wishes. So here he is holding in his hands the capacity to fulfill all the wishes of all beings with this wish-fulfilling jewel. So you begin to really understand his infinite power, his infinite capacity and his infinite ability to manifest and to have mastery over all of the different aspects of manifestation. And you may not see this at first. And, you know, I look at this Tantra pretty much constant, this Tanka pretty much constantly <laughs> because I have... I have an image here in the room where I am. I have one over the altar in the center. I have one over my bed. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little obsessive. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm always looking at this. And of course, whenever I go see my friend who's the chiropractor, I you know, get there early so I can go look at her tanka. <laughs> you know, so, so, but, so I look at this constantly and I did not see this for a long time. And I'm going to ask you to take a look 
at what is happening around his heart. And I think, I hope you'll be able to see it in the image that you have. But there's something amazing there. I don't know if you can see it. It's brown. See if you can see it. It's a deer. <laughs> He's holding a deer. And there's several meanings for this. Of course, uh, Buddha gave his first set of teachings in Deer Park, right? So there's an, a reference to the, the teachings, all of the teachings of Buddhism. And also, it, you know, uh, uh, practitioners often had a deer skin that they that was the that was the thing that they slept on and the thing that they wrapped themselves in the mendicants um, in early Buddhism. But I've done a lot of meditating with this uh, with this tanka, in case you didn't notice. Um, and that deer for me is it indicates a heart of peace. You know, his heart of peace. And I just love the way that deer is tucked in there. And um, I, I would recommend spending some time with that. <laughs> and uh, so, so you have so many, so many things that are gathered together here in this, in this depiction of Lala Ketujvara or Chenrezig. You have his ability to perceive compa compassionately suffering in so many places at once his capacities to relieve it, his mastery over the physical and the subtle realms, his ability to grant wishes and to bring forward the manifestation of anything that is desired. And he's doing this in so many realms and in so many moments at once, okay? So we have this amazing field of energy that is condensed into this image. And we're going to spend some time in meditation with that field of energy. So you'll be able to perceive it more fully. Um, now I'd like to, um, let's see, what time do we have? Yeah, I, I've got to kind of, kind of move right through because we do want to have time for um, the meditation. And then we'll take questions at the end. So let's turn to the five Buddha families that are the, the, const, the, each, the two Buddhas that are in, in, in a blissful engagement. And they, they're, they're basically in coitus, the male and the female. And the fact that they're in coitus is, indicates bliss. And there's five different couples and each couple indicates a different Buddha family. And you'll see each one of them is a different color. And the colors represent the different nature of the transformational fields that they employ in order to transmute poison into wisdom. Now this is key, this is fundamental to Tantra, this transmutational quality, this transfiguration possibility. And um, so um, the, the different uh, Buddha families are, the blue one is called Vairochana, and um, the poison that the, the, the blue uh, Buddha family specializes in transmutation in transmuting is anger, and it transmutes it into mirror-like wisdom. Um, that's the wisdom that it transmutes the anger into. And then you have the yellow um, Buddha family called, and this is Ratna, <coughs> Ratna Sambhava. And this transmutes the poison of pride or miserliness into equanimity. And then you have the Amitabha family. And, uh, and this is, uh, sorry, the Rat, uh, Ratna Sambhava is of course yellow. And then the Amitabha family is red. And the poison that it transmutes is attachment into discriminating wisdom. And then we have the, in the white Buddha family, the 
uh, a Mogasita uh, Buddha family, which transmutes jealousy into all accomplish accomplishing wisdom, all accomplishing wisdom. And then you have the Akshoba, Akshobhya um, Buddha family, which um, is clear or void and it, uh, or space, and it uh, indicating space. And um, it transmutes stupidity into all encompassing wisdom. Now, this business of the transmutation of the poisons into the wisdoms is fundamental to Tantra. And it's something that we explore at length in a class by that name. Um, and we don't have time. I wish we did because it's uh, the practices associated with the five Buddha families are profound. Um, but they are here supporting the uh, activities of Chenrezig, helping to transmute the negativity of the people or the beings that he's trying to help, right? So you see their role here. And they're doing this in a blissful, uh, indicating their, their connection with nirvana, with bliss, with the clear light, right? Okay. So then we have, coming down again, we have the Dakinis. And as I mentioned, they are a female embodiment of enlightened wisdom energy. And they can appear in different contexts. And they're off, they often appear at moments of transition, especially as a person is moving from a, sort of an intellectual or conceptual understanding of, of uh a philosophical or religious concept in, in the practice of Buddhism into a more experiential understanding. And um, they are, they are, they can be very, there can be different types of Dakinis, but they're, they're often a messenger of, of truth. And they preside, uh, I love Lama Sultram says, they preside over the funeral of self-deception. It's just so beautiful. So it gives you an idea of their activity. So there's two of those. So they're here helping, helping, you know, again, Chenrezig, helping people rid themselves of self-deception, uh, you know, ridding themselves of attachments and um, helping them transition from one state of being to another. And then we, we're coming down and we have Vajrapani in the right hand corner as you're looking at the Tanka. And Vajrapani, as I mentioned, is a Dharma protector. And um, Vajrapani, um, again, is the uh, embodiment of the infinite power of Buddha. And there's a story about how when Buddha was giving a teaching at Vulture's Peak, um, that his, his cousin, uh, Devadatta, who was jealous of Buddha, um, rolled a huge boulder uh, down the mountain, and it was just ready to crush Buddha, and Vajrapani uh, split it open just before it reached Buddha, and, um, you know, indicating his enormous uh, powers, and Buddha, at that point, made him the protector of the Dharma. And this, I, and and he's also the guardian of a uh, guardian of the tantra, these esoteric teachings, and he's also called often the the lord of the secrets because he's protecting these this field of knowledge, and this field of knowledge, the dharma needs protection on a couple of different levels um, within the practitioner. If a person has not, if a person has mixed intention for trying to understand the power or engaging with the power of the Tantra, they can be harmed. And so uh, they, they'll harm themselves because it, it, purifying one's intention in approaching this level of power that is held in the Tantric teachings is very important. And, and Vajrapani helps with that purification along with Vajrasattva and Vajradhara who are often called the gateway to the Tantra. We don't have them here. But um, these are, Vajrapani is protecting and he protects by re helping remove obstacles in that same way that he removed that boulder within 
the practitioner so that they will not harm themselves with their mixed intentions. So he helps remove, remove the obstacles of a, of a negative intention. And then also protects from outside forces, you know, different demons and, and you know, Mara, of course, and all these different um, manifestations of negative intention. Vajrapani addresses those as well. So he's here protecting Chenrezig's activity. And he has some pretty interesting uh, indications of his power. He has, of course, his tiger skin, which indicates his fearlessness. He's in an active pose. He's ready to act. He uh, has a threatening mudra for overcoming hindrances. In his right hand is a Vajra scepter. And of course, the Vajra is always very important in Mahayana Buddhism. It's often translated as a diamond thunderbolt, a diamond or thunderbolt or diamond thunderbolt. And so, you know, it's diamonds, of course, cannot be cut by anything. Thunderbolts are very, very powerful. And, you know, this he he uses this power to, to not only protect but to engage spiritual awakening. And that's part of protecting. When you can awaken someone, then you protect the teachings that they, because they will be able to approach the teachings with a clearer intent. He also has snakes of anger, and, um, which he controls with the superior force of his compassion. And he has, of course, the third eye of wisdom open and penetrating. And then uh, last but not least, the thing that you see first are all the flames of wisdom that emanate from all of his pores. So he has, you know, this purifying, these purifying flames that purify anything that would try to damage the, the Dharma. So it's so wonderful that Chenrezig has this massive field of protection so that he can engage in this enlightened activity in an uninterrupted way. So important. So that's Vajrapani. And then we have Manjushri, which we explored last week. And as I mentioned, the, he is the embodiment of Buddha's infinite wisdom. And you see the flaming sword of wisdom in his right hand. It is double-edged, and it cuts through all the different layers of obscuration and misconception. And it, you know, it does things like distinguishing between um, things that are relative and things that are ultimate, things that um, are... Um, excuse me, let me just get to my, to my notes, um, things that um, are caught in duality, he unites them. And um, the, also the double-edged sword indicates protection from two fears, both of nirvana and samsara. And you'd say, why would you need protection from samsara, I mean, from nirvana? Of course, we all know why you need protection from samsara. Samsara is the realm of suffering that beings who are unaware of the consequences of their action are caught in. And this is the place where, where uh, Chinrezik works. And, um, and so it's very clear, you know, why there would be so much fear in samsara because so many people don't understand and are afraid of what they are manifesting. And then you have the fears of nirvana. And nirvana, of course, is that state of being that where you are liberated from samsara in Buddhist teaching. And um, why would you need to be protected from nirvana? Because of the possibility of moving into uh, an enlightened state without the intention, without, from a Mahayana point of view, without an intention to help liberate others. Because from a Mahayana point of view, if you do not have that altruistic intention as you enter into, some, in, as you enter into enlightenment or nirvana, there's the danger of becoming complacent 
or indifferent to others suffering and that is a huge danger to be afraid of right so and then um in his left hand he has the lotus flower and a volume of the perfection of wisdom sutras which are of course you know the fundamental teachings in mahayana buddhism and uh, which indicates of course manjushri's mastery over these teachings the prajnaparamita and um and it also indicates that the best ways to develop the wisdom of manjushri is to study these sutras and to meditate upon manjushri and um so so you have this field of wisdom that is also supporting chenrezig's activities now i said i was going to tell you something important at the end and um it's, we're not quite at the end but i want to tell you this before we uh, uh maybe we'll take a few questions before the meditation um now in case you didn't notice, for those of you that are Buddhist practitioners, this is a field of this whole tanka is teaching about the path of the bodhisattva. Because a bodhisattva is a person who is, has become enlightened or a being that has become enlightened that have, through their own practice, their own study, their own meditative force, their own intellectual inquiry, they have attained a level of realization that brings them beyond the grip of samsara. And, and they enter into a state of enlightenment or nirvana. But at, in, in, the, in the Theravadan schools, or the Hinayana schools, um, this is the point of the practice to attain nirvana. And that's it. But in Mahayana schools, or the uh, one is called individual vehicle, one's called universal vehicle. This is the universal vehicle, Mahayana. The idea is to return to the realm of samsara and to begin to help other beings, which, as the Dalai Lama says, is highly beneficial for the practitioner because there's a whole turn of the wheel in terms of the teachings and understandings that one then attains about the nature of samsara that one could not perceive in the pursuit of liberating oneself. There's a whole new level of teachings that comes as you seek to liberate others. And this is what we were talking about, Faten mentioned that we're studying this, uh, the psychology of the Bodhisattva in a class that we're teaching right now, Sacred Stream. And it's, um, there, there are so many teachings on this path. And the, um, this Tanka captures all of the, the, all of the necessities that a Bodhisattva might need. <laughs> Compassion, in the form of Chenrezig, power or skillful means in terms of Vajrapani, and wisdom in terms of Manjushri. Because you can't have, if you only have compassion and you don't have the power to execute, to change someone's situation, your compassion is incomplete. If you don't have the wisdom, to know what is needed in order to help a person, your compassion is incomplete. You need all three. You need wisdom, you need the compassion to be able to help others, and then you need the wisdom, and then you need the power and the skillful means. And you have it all right here with Chenrezig, Manjushri, and Vajrapani. All of the requirements of the path of the Bodhisattva are illuminated in this amazing tanka and you have in addition to that you have the five buddha families as the support of this transformational field that everyone who enters into the path of taking refuge out of the realm of samsara enters into so you have it all here right you know like you know i have this friend of mine always talks about you know we have this joke where, you know, you know, you know, she'll do something for me and I'll, you know, and then I'll 
and then she'll do something else for me and then she'll do another thing for me. And I'm like, you are one stop shopping, you know, or then I'll do something for her and she'll do something and then I'll do another thing for her and then she'll do another thing for me all in very disparate places. And, you know, I'll, you know, you know, and she'll say, you know, we'll, we'll say to each other, you're just one stop shopping, right? This is one stop shopping. <laughs> this tanka is one stop shopping. <laughs> and um, if you can understand all of the different qualities of the tanka deeply in meditation, um, you you can have infinite learning here just by looking at this med if you if you if you had to be on a desert island take this tanka with you if you could only take one thing take this with you because you could have education for the rest of your lives through many lifetimes and um, so um, I'd like to do a meditation um, to kind of bring home this point because we're talking about this conceptually, but I'd like to I'd like to bring it into um, uh, experiential uh, experience. But before we do, um, actually, let's go ahead and do the meditation, and then we'll take questions if we have time because I, I want to make sure we have time for the meditation. So um, let's go ahead and get settled. Just noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body. And just sitting with your back straight, your hands in your lap, feet on the ground or folded in your lap or you know, cross-legged. Your eyes closed or semi-closed. And as you settle, just noticing where your breath is. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes and noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And if any other thoughts should come into your mind, just let them pass through like clouds in the sky. And then return to your breath. And as your mind settles, just letting all of your inner senses to begin to open, your inner sense of taste, touch, and smell, your inner sense of sight and hearing, but especially that sixth sense of just knowing. And as your inner senses open, just continue to follow your breath inward into that place where everything that you've ever known or felt or sensed or dreamed or imagined is recorded. And as you come into this place, just allowing yourself now to Bring the image of the central image of this tanka, Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara, into your heart and into your mind. The thousand arms with the thousand eyes in the palms, perceiving 
suffering in a thousand places at once. The implements that relieve suffering, the flaming sword, the mind of the Buddha, the plant that relieves all ills. And remembering the 11 heads that indicate how this process of relieving suffering is something that Chen Rezik engages in in 11 realms at once, a thousand places at once. And just remembering the rainbow skirt, indicating his mastery over the elements and the five pure lights, the movement from the subtle realms into the physical realms and his mastery over those processes. Remembering the wish fulfilling jewel the ability to grant any wish of any being. Remembering the heart of peace. Just letting yourself stabilize here in the presence of Chenrezig taking in the nature of his power and the extent of his capacities and the depth of his compassion. Knowing that his compassion is supported by the wisdom of Manjushri and the power of Vajrapani and the transformational capacities of the five Buddha families and the assistance of the Dakinis. And just allowing yourself to stabilize in this field of infinite power and capacity. And as you find yourself here in the presence of Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara, just allow yourself now to let Chenrezig perceive a suffering that you have been dealing with, a pain that you may have been dealing with, perhaps something that you know well, or perhaps something that you may not fully understand. And just allow his ability to look deeply into you and into the nature of your suffering or your pain. To open your awareness to this pain or this suffering. knowing that it's safe to allow yourself to do this because you are in this field of infinite compassion supported by wisdom and power and transformational possibility. And as you allow yourself to open to this pain or this suffering that you're holding, just asking Chinrezik to work with his many implements to help offer you insight and perhaps even relief or release from this suffering. And just allowing this infinite field of compassion to move into the place where you're suffering or where you're in pain. 
and taking some deep breaths, drawing in. power of this compassion that is supported by wisdom and skillful means and just allowing that suffering or that pain to emerge into the possibility of transformation. It may not happen all at once right now, but just to consider the possibility that this could change, that this could transform. this infinite field of capacity and compassion. And just allowing yourself to try to articulate what you're learning and what you're feeling here and what insight Shinrasik may be offering you through this field of compassion filled with capacity. And just allowing yourself to go ahead and bring all of this understanding back with you, knowing that you can come back to this place at any time, knowing that you can return here into the field of Chenrezig. at any moment and just allowing yourself to gather all of your insight and all of your understanding and feeling any shift that you may be feeling in the way that you're holding this pain or this suffering or perhaps even within the pain or the suffering itself. And as you do, just allowing yourself to try to match the suffering, match the compassion for your suffering that Chen Rezik has. Understanding his deep compassion for this pain and this suffering and knowing that you can attain that same level of compassion for your own pain and for your own suffering. That this can be a practice for you. And just feeling the healing qualities of this compassion. As you return to your breath, just watching your breath move in and move out. Stepping back into your breath, holding your experience of Chen Rezik here in your heart and in your mind. And just breathing in and breathing out, resting in your breath.
And then when you're ready, just following your breath back out into the room as you exhale, just breathing out and following your breath back out into the room. And then opening your eyes whenever you're ready, taking all the time that you need to come back gently into the room. And just taking a moment to reflect on your meditation and you may want to write a few notes down. And then I'd like to see if anyone has any questions. Either about the meditation or about the lecture. You can put the questions into the chat. Lisa, uh, Diane was asking earlier about the little deer, but I'm not sure what the question is. Diane, do you want to say what you were wondering about the little deer? You might be muted, Diane. Um, I didn't have a question, Issa. You asked, does anyone know what's there? There's something special uh, right oh, there. Oh. And I wrote down the yes. little deer. Yes, yes. But I, I did you have a question. It. You saw it. Yeah, I did have <laughs> a question great. since I'm unmuted. Uh, this is so <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Wow. Um, I'm sitting in my room and there's like a wall sized poster of this and it's just been a revelation and just revealed so much so thank you but at the very bottom below Avalokiteshvara's feet is yes. that rainbow circle and yes. there's these things in it and I've seen right. like, the ritual objects like that big roundy thing mm -hmm. before and I've never known what those are if you could tell us about it thank you sorry thanks I meant to mention that so there's a couple of different interpretations for this um, this is often considered to be a mirror the round um, the round uh, white circle there is often considered to be a mirror, and that in, the, in, in that in that interpretation, it, it's indication of the you know the sort of the illusory nature of reality, right? But I think that you know I've done a little bit of meditation on this, and the thing that I always get from this circle of rainbows and all the implements is that it's a teaching about the senses and um, about the depth of the senses and the way in which these teachings are registered through all of the different sense channels mm -hmm. and, and how the sense channels register these teachings. So you have the, the lyre, you know, sound, you have the mirror sight, you know, so an idea. Isa, uh, a couple of questions um, about one about the Manjushri talk. Is that on the Sacred Stream website? The Manjushri talk from last week is on, yeah. uh, I think it's on your YouTube channel and there, mm -hmm. uh, there should be, there will be a link on our website to it. Okay, I will look it up and put it in there. Okay, and, and no, then, I'm, just yeah. I'm just confirming you did record this tonight, right? Yes, yeah. yes, we did, we are recording. And are you gonna make this available on your YouTube site yeah. also? Great, we are, yeah. Great, wonderful. And then another um, sort of logistical question, do we have permission to share the link to the image or would you rather we not? Uh, no, no, it's totally fine, yeah. <laughs> There's no proprietary thing around this. I mean, we're so lucky to have this, We, you know, like, you know, the Good. more people who encounter it, the better, right? 
And again, you know, just to pay homage to this wonderful artist. Uh, this wonderful unknown artist. And yeah. then uh, Laura said she has a question about a couple of details, but she didn't say what they are. Laura, do you wanna tell us? Yeah, thank you again so much. These uh, meditations are so powerful. Um, and uh, yeah, so new to me, so I'm, I'm grateful that you're my guide into this. Um, I just, there, there are two little visual details that kept jumping out at me, even last time with the Manjushri. The kind of background, this kind of silver and kind of bronze, goldish marbling that we also see around um, Chen Rizig outside of the arms. Um, I wonder, I don't know, I just find it so striking, but I, I don't have a, I don't have a, a read on it. I wonder what you think that is. From Manjushri, that, I'm sorry, thank you for pointing that out. That's, that indicates his level of mental clarity. Oh, okay. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Yep. Huh. And, and is, it, is it the colors or is it the texture or? It's, it's this br brilliant kind of shining, you know, it's indicating this kind of shining, sparkling, you know, clarity, right? Huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I wondered too, like on, on Chen Rizig's hands, there's a couple near the bottom that have little like rainbow... Uh, like Buddhas. Buddhas. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, That's, what is that? That's the Buddha's mind. That's the Buddha's mind, the emanation of the Buddha's mind. Wow, beautiful, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so Isa, I've, I've put the link to last week's talk in the chat. Oh, wonderful, and thank you. Then there are two more questions. Okay. Uh, why 11 heads? Is there any symbolism behind that number? I wish I knew, I don't know. Mm. Probably is, gotta be but I don't know it. Hmm. You reach, I've got to look, I've found something I don't know about this tonka. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I can see. Can I, can I ask a follow-up? Infinitely. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Uh, yeah. What, uh, I know so little about tonkas, like someone else made another tonka, would it also have 11 heads? It's like, is that like yes, a thing? Yes, yes, the, the okay. central image, the central image would be the same. You okay. Know, the thousand arms, the implements, the okay. rainbow skirt. I don't, I've never actually seen the deer tucked in in any other, ah. any other which is why I just love that deer. <laughs> well, the next question is about the deer. Yeah. I've heard that the little deer is a symbol of taming the animal impulses. Is that one possible interpretation? You know, that, I mean, you bring up a good point. There's so many possible, in, po there's so many possible uh, interpretations for so many of these tankas and or, so many of the images in the tankas. I can see where you could go there, but that hasn't, I mean, and I, you know, I certainly wouldn't say oh, reject it out of hand. Um, but that hasn't, uh, it, what I would recommend, you know, is to meditate with these images yourself to mm -hmm. verify the validity mm -hmm. of the different interpretations mm -hmm. that you could have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hesitate, you know, for those of you that are my students, you know that I'm not a big one for, you know, uh, giving uh, sort of traditional kinds of interpretations of things that I'm always encouraging my students to discover their own meaning and their own understanding and engaging with something. So this is a little bit of a departure for me in terms of a, a, a way of teaching. And, but I, I'm offering you this as a doorway into larger exploration of your mm -hmm. own. Mm -hmm. And you know, pointing out these different images and giving you the the more or less traditional the deer is you know a, you know heart of peace is definitely my thing, but um, but you know of course the, the idea of the rainbow skirts the idea of the implements the idea of the thousand arms these are all traditional interpretations and I offer them to you because the tankas are a teaching tool to bring you into these realms. And you have to have a consens a more or less consensus understanding of what the images are indicating in order to be able to enter in and to go fully into the realm. But once you have entered into that realm, I highly encourage you to do your own exploration. 
And, you know, you can repeat this particular um, meditation that we did this evening and do this. You can explore different types of pain that you have, different types of suffering. You can also, I mean, there's a hundred ways to work with this meditationally, you know, to, you can, you can, um, you know, do you know, one of the traditional ways is to do a deity merge, a deity meditation where you are merging yourself with the field of the day de of the deity. And then you are emanating the qualities and mm -hmm. focusing the qualities out into ordinary reality to other beings. So that's, and that's the meditation that we did last night in class um, mm. uh, in the psychology of the Bodhisattva. And, um, you know, um, I, actually that's not available. I was gonna say it's available, but it's not. But, but that's, that's something that you could do. Um, and, and um, you know, maybe I'll come back and we'll do that meditation together. Um, yeah. You know, I can, we can, I can, you know, we, uh, there's, a, there's so much that I love to teach in this area. You know, and I'd be happy to come back and do that at some point. Wonderful. To do some deity meditation if you want me to. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, Isa, it's 8.59. There were two more questions. Do you want to? Is it okay for you all to go a little bit over? Good. Wonderful. No, it's okay. All right. Okay. So uh, the next one is about a symbol as well. So you might say, well, you figured out, but <laughs> maybe you have an answer. What are the little rainbow squares below the loincloth? Those, that's the rainbow skirt, the little rainbow squares. That's actually a skirt that, and th those are in indicative of his uh, um, mastery over the, the, four. The, the five elements and the five pure lights, the, the movement of phenomenon from the most subtle to the most gross and back again. Okay, beautiful. And then Keegan has a question as well. Hi. Um, sometimes when I practice like compassion practices or uh, deity practices like a medicine Buddha practice and I, and I stabilize even for a few moments, I sometimes have like pretty intense somatic experiences. Like I get like a, like a very quick wave of nausea or like a stabbing feeling or like panic. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any guidance to like how sure. to work with that. Sure. So that's kind of, um, that's what we call when I, I teach classes in, in, in integrated energy medicine, and we call that energy burn. And what that is, that what, what energy burn is and what, what you're experiencing, I believe, I've tried this out and see if it works or see if it makes sense to you, is you are exposing yourself to a field of power that is greater than the amount of power that you generally run through your energy system. Mm. And, and it's like you're usually running on 110 and by entering into the field of the medicine Buddha, that's like 220, right? And you're trying to run 220 through 110, right? So, so that, that's natural that that would happen. So there's a couple of things that I could offer you. So one thing when you're doing deity meditation practices, whenever you're expanding your feel, your capacity to extend into holding greater and greater fields of power, very important to drink a lot of water and to drink water that's been covered. Don't drink water that's been sitting out. Drink water that you've just poured or that's had a cover on it. And um, because when you're doing this work, uh, you you are working with power. You're working with energy, and water is a conductor of energy. And um, if you don't have enough water in your system, that energy is going to draw from the water in your blood, and that's why you get the you get the kind of pain or the nausea, right? So, but if you have plenty of water, you're going to be in a better shape. Also, I really recommend having good nutrition like especially fat like veg vegetarian fat like avocado peanut butter and having don't don't do it on an empty stomach i don't know how anybody thought aesthetics were going to be able to do this <laughs> because you need a lot because again you're working with power and energy and it has you need a lot of minerals to be able to hold and ground it in your system so that eating fat will help that 
Then the other thing that will really help with that is to, uh, and that'll help prepare you. And then the other thing that you can do is if you are in that state after meditating, go outside and get your feet in the earth or splash water on your face, drink fresh air, drink in fresh air, get yourself exposed to the elements and the elements will balance your system out. And if you, if you, you don't know about Isa's space clearing spray, but it's a, it's a spray that I developed to help clear spaces in the space clearing society that we have at the sacred stream. We clear spaces where healers live and work. And uh, often we can't burn um, sage or Palo Santo in places like hospitals. Um, so I developed these sprays that are very clearing and um, they're really a nice meditation aid because they will refresh you and restore their plants and they will restore your field. So you can get those on the website, but you know, you know, there's a lot of other things you can do. You don't have to get that, but I, I love that, you know, myself. So there's some thoughts. Thank hopefully, you. Yeah. Hopefully that'll be helpful. And you know, the other thing you can do is you can ask like, especially with uh, if you're working with Medicine Buddha, you can ask in meditation, is there any practice that I can do to help deepen my ability to hold power? Like basically, it's, it's like you're asking, can I, how do I add more transformers so that I have, that I can hold more power more easily? That's something that you could ask the Medicine Buddha. Okay. Thank you, Isa. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here. And it's such a pleasure. I love being with the San Francisco Dharma Collective community. And I can't thank you enough for inviting me. And uh, Noam, thank you for all you do all the time. You, I know you do so much to keep the collective together. And I know a lot of your work is unseen and, and unheralded, but I would like to see it and herald it. <laughs> well, thank you. This is, this is why I do it. This is to, to facilitate wonderful teachers like you coming and spreading the Dharma and, and their wisdom. I, I really appreciate this evening. I want to just say a couple of things to everyone. I'm going to re-put the, the subscription link for Sacred Stream if you want to subscribe to their newsletter and then there's also one from the san francisco dharma collective if you want to subscribe to our newsletter and then if you are able to donate the dharma collective is um, as i mentioned entirely volunteer run and um, entirely fueled by your donations so if you can donate we would appreciate that no amount is too big or too small and um, this will allow us to keep going and to uh, support our teachers our wonderful teachers and if you can't then that's okay too we know these are odd and difficult times for people and your presence here is also a, a, a token of generosity right because there's no teacher if there's no student so um, thanks everyone for being here and thank you so much, Isa, for your teaching. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Good luck in your practice. Yeah.